Brussels, um, um, Ambassador Boris um, Ruge and uh, Tobias uh, Bunde are with us and they will uh, present to Polish public uh, the main findings, uh, the main way of thinking uh, uh, behind this report. Um, I was uh, invited uh, to the launching event of this report in September uh, of this year. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, there was this uh, rare occasion uh, in this year when we uh, were able to meet in person uh, and sit on the stage and discuss uh, to each other on the stage. Uh, but uh, uh, preparing myself to this discussion, um, I was one of probably one of the first Polish readers of this report. And I realized that uh, first, it is an excellent piece of work in more than one aspect. Well thought over, well written and convincingly presented. Um, then uh, I uh, what, what, what crossed my mind is that uh, um, the institution behind that is Munich Security Conference is a worldwide respected expert institution. It, and uh, so it means that this report would have an impact not only on the course of German debate, which would be just enough uh, to have a good reason to discuss it in Poland, but also on perception of Germany by other allies and foes as well. Um, the third reason which, which in, in already then crossed my mind and uh, um, um, created a kind of the determination from my side to invite the authors uh, to Poland and stage in discussion with them um, um, is following. I came to the opinion that given the Polish-German interdependence on defense and security, it would be highly recommended to, to discuss uh, with the authors uh, the main thesis of the report among the, the members of Polish Foreign Security Committee. We have been following German debate on, on self-perception about the aspirations um, the bio, which, uh, uh, what role Germany are, are about to play in, in world stage. Um, uh, it's definitely fascinating the discussion. Um, uh, but it would be great to have more Polish German talk on, on mutual aspirations. Uh, as I said, there is a Polish German interdependence on defense and security. We provide, uh, and we, we provide. Uh, uh, security uh, to the NATO Eastern flank, and we contribute to German security as well, as a both. So um, that would be, that would be, I think, uh, um, good uh, to uh, interact intellectually uh, and inspire each other. So that was all these reasons why I decided to uh, to organize. Um, uh, this uh, event, this conversation today by peace. And having said that, again, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce to you um, German uh, ambassador to Warsaw, Arne Freitag von Lohenhofen. Ambassador, the floor is yours. All oh, the screens of us is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm uh, very glad to, uh, to see you on the, on the screen and also uh, Boris Ruge, my good and close friend. And um, I think it's an excellent and timely idea to present this report today um, in Poland. Um, many partners have high expectations towards um, Germany and its foreign and security uh, policy. And it is crucial for us to discuss our future orientation with our closest partners. And of course, this includes Poland at an early stage. The report addresses the um, rapid and fundamental changes uh, which we are witnessing in, in the world, uh, the unprecedented unraveling of the liberal world order, the rise of China and other authoritarian uh, regimes, climate change, um, erupt um, uh, the uh, new technologies. It also addresses what they call the erosion of certainties 
uh, an expression which I uh, like uh, very much and that struck me while reading through it. And of course, it analyzes the state of play of uh, um, the domestic German uh, debate um, on what is called the Munich consensus. Uh, the um, um, Munich Security Conference in 2014, um, where there was a, a joint call for greater responsibility by Germany uh, in the future. And um, um, a lot of things have uh, actually um, been um, uh, consequences of this call. I would say, for instance, um, our leading role in international hotspots such as the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, um, the increase um, of our defense spending by about 40 percent and the more active involvement on the eastern uh, flank in EFP. Um, <clears throat> but um, there are many other things you can uh, enumerate, and we will certainly discuss them today. The question, however, remains, um, uh, are we doing enough? Are we doing it fast enough? And is our adaptation substantial en enough? Because not only our um, uh, policies are changing, but the world uh, around us is changing. It's a moving target in, in fast forward. Um, and so we have to compare our change to, to the change of, of the world. And that includes, um, among many other issues, the questions of hard security, where uh, we remain um, somewhat more uh, reluctant than on issues of uh, crisis management, um, uh, uh, for instance. Now, all these questions are particularly relevant now with the onset of the new Biden administration. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, what we discussed today will also be seen in, in the light of all the uh, discussions we are starting now. I would say uh, in Germany, the uh, outcome of the US uh, uh, elections um, have been greeted with a lot of uh, hope. Um, many opportunities are seen because Biden we know as a multilateralist, as a staunch um, uh, proponent of a transatlantic partnership. But um, also, it seems to me that many observers have been somewhat cautious because uh, they say that's all true. Uh, but um, it doesn't mean that we will go back to normal uh, because the world is changing and um, the pivot to Asia, the uh, uh, critical view of China, the trade conflicts, they will remain under the new administration. And also an exp expectation um, for Europe to do more. And I think that is an overriding theme that we will have to look at. Um, discussions are already starting in the European Union to prepare some concrete um, uh, proposals for the 20th of January. And uh, with that, I think I don't want to go too deeply into the substance, but uh, leave that up to you. And I'll be uh, uh, extremely interested and fascinated to hear your views on, on this and also about um, possible um, uh, joint action between uh, Germany and Poland within the EU and within NATO, first and foremost. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, and I hope that this event would uh, initiate our long standing, long lasting cooperation um, on various uh, uh, topics. Now, we have our uh, kickoff panel um, with two designated um, Polish commentators, Justyna Gotkowska of OSW, uh, Center for Pol um, Eastern Studies, and Marcin Terlikowski. Uh, PhD holder, expert on security from our, our institution, uh, uh, PISM. This uh, part, and of course, um, their reactions would be commented, um, responded somehow uh, by Ambassador Boris Ruge and Tobias Bunde, the authors of, of, of the piece, which are, uh, as I said, the point of departure of our Polish-German discussions about where Germany is going. Um, uh, uh, in foreign and defense uh, uh, policy. And the, uh, this part of the conversation will be chaired by Deputy Head of, of Research in, uh, at Peace, Mukasz Kulesa, 
So thank you very much, Wukash. Um, our screens uh, uh, um, are yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and let me let me also uh, welcome you uh, to uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, as it was already said, let me just uh, add to the praise of the uh, report. Uh, I think uh, the timing for discussing it is perfect because we are in the middle of very intense discussions in Germany and Europe in a transatlantic setting exactly uh, about uh, the uh, things which are in this report and indeed uh, the victory of Joe Biden clarifies at least one aspect of the international relations. Uh, let me start with some words on the organization of the of today's discussion. It's a little bit complicated, uh, so please please bear with me. Um, and uh, I suggest that we start with the presentation of the report, and then we uh, move uh, into uh, the comments for the for the Polish experts. Uh, who would present uh, their views on the report, but also more generally uh, about the German uh, foreign and security um, policy. Uh, we will then open up a broader discussion that will proceed in two tracks. Uh, track number one, uh, we have uh, a group of excellent uh, Polish experts on foreign and security policy uh, more generally, but also on uh, Germany and German-Polish uh, relations uh, who are connected through through Zoom, so they will be able to participate in the discussion through the usual uh, Zoom channel, the, the virtual raising hands and the chat. Uh, but secondly, uh, we have people uh, from hopefully all over the world uh, watching uh, this uh, debate uh, through YouTube, uh, through Facebook, through Twitter. Um, and uh, I would encourage you uh, to post your comments, ask questions uh, in uh, the uh, chat functions of, this, uh, of these tools. Um, and this will be uh, sent to me. Uh, I'll try to, man to bring as many voices as possible uh, into this discussion. It is a little bit of multitasking, you know, so please bear with me throughout this whole uh, process. Uh, but we start with the issue at hand. Uh, so presenting the report uh, will be Ambassador Boris Ruge, uh, Vice Chairman of the Munich Security Conference, but also former ambassador to Saudi Arabia and former deputy head of mission to Washington, D.C. Uh, and Dr. Tob Tobias Bunde, uh, Deputy Director of Research and Policy uh, at the MSC and also the lead uh, author of this uh, report. So, gentlemen, the virtual floor is yours now. Many thanks, Bukash. Many thanks, Slavek. Um, we're delighted to be here. Thanks for having us for this German-Polish discussion. And um, it's also very good to see my friend Ant Freitag, who I have known for 30 years at this point, which is in itself uh, a bit of a shocking fact to me. Um, just a few personal observations before we, we go into the report, if I may. I started out as a student of East European history at the University of Cologne in the early 1980s, and I've always had a great respect for Poland and its people. And in 1988, I had an opportunity to spend one month at um, uh, the summer school of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, which made a big impression on me and where I learned quite a lot. A year later, in 1989, I joined the German Foreign Service, and um, I am therefore old enough to understand um, what Germany and the Germans owe to Poland um, and the people of Poland, uh, because quite simply without you, we would have been unable to achieve German unification. Um, an important fact to keep in mind and something to be grateful for. To us at MSC in general, and to me personally, um, bringing a Polish perspective into the picture is very important. And we were delighted to have you, um, Sławek, at the Berlin kickoff um, event for the Zeitenwende report um, in early October. And um, uh, this is wonderful. I only wish we could do it in Warsaw, sitting together in a room, but that will be possible. And, and uh, let's look forward to that kind of event. In terms of housekeeping, I would just say one thing, which is that 
obviously the MSC is on record with this report, but for the sake of an open conversation today, uh, whatever Tobias and I say should perhaps be taken as our personal opinions. They may or may not reflect the views held by the Munich Security Conference. And um, I'm sure that on a number of points, they do not reflect the, the view of the German government with apologies to Hans Freitag. So uh, we'll be discussing here as, as free people and uh, whatever we say should not be held against Chancellor Merkel or the government. Um, Zeitenwende means a uh, turn of an era. You could also say paradigm shift, perhaps. And what we were trying to convey in our report is that Germany and Europe are in the midst of a fundamental transition, which requires us to rethink basics of diplomacy, security, and defense. And as Anne Freitag already mentioned, there are two there's one specific reference point to start with for this report, which is that um, a good six years ago at the 2014 Munich Security Conference, our then president, Joachim Gauck, and our then foreign minister, uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, and our then defense minister, Ursula von der Leyen, um, articulated something that became known as the Munich Consensus, which was that Germany ought to take on more responsibility and ought to um, act in a um, early and decisive and substantial manner in foreign policy. So the obvious question for us at the MSC six years later was, have we delivered? And the answer that we gave is basically, and I quote, Germany, German foreign policy is evolving, but the world around us is evolving even faster. In other words, um, we've done a few things, and it's not negligible what we've done, uh, but we need to do much more. The elements of change are familiar to all of you and all of us. Um, the dissolution of the rules-based order, if we want to call it that, the rise of China, great power competition, including a willingness to use military force and break international law, rapid technological upheaval with implications for a balance of power between the great powers, increasing impact of climate change, and of course, um, important element, a reorientation of the United States of America that reaches farther back than the 2016 election, and um, which essentially involves the United States being less willing to take on the disproportionate burden for upholding elements of the international order, and also the United States being relatively weaker than it was. Uh, in other words, the unipolar moment um, that existed for uh, two decades or so has certainly passed and that has important implications. At a rhetorical level, um, there's an understanding among the political class in Germany that we need to respond to these changes and that they are significant. Um, around Germany and uh, around Europe, um, many have said something to the effect that Germans must take and Europeans must take their destiny into their own hands. But I think um, if we take a, a hard look at the reality, then we can also conclude that we have failed to do so. We have failed to live up to this massive change that we are witnessing. And the second reference point for this report is the German national election that is coming up in September of next year. So what we tried to do with this report was to bring out some of these fundamental changes and to provide food for thought for our political parties for how we can respond appropriately um, to these changes. Wolfgang Ischinger, Tobias Bunde and I went out um, and had a large number of conversations around Berlin including with the top level of the executive branch, including with many, many members of parliament and obviously um, senior civil servants and military officers and others. And um, the solution as we see it to this, this uh, big challenge that we face is to make Europe strong. Um, and that requires Germany to step up, to lead um, and to become what Tobias um, has referred to um, in a previous paper as an enabling power. So Germany um, to gear up and to help make Europe a significant and serious 
geopolitical actor. Of course, as all of you, I think, realize, the Munich Security Conference um, is all about strong transatlantic relations. Strong transatlantic relations are part of our DNA, if you like. Um, and it's important to stress that we see absolutely no contradiction between a strong Europe and European sovereignty even, um, and a strong transatlantic relationship. And in fact, um, as we see it, it's only a strong and capable Europe that will be able to um, engage with the US and keep the US engaged in European security, which is something that we cannot do without. We need the, Euro the United States of America at our side to deliver um, the necessary level of European security. Making Europe strong is not something we can delegate to people in Brussels. Um, Germany, as the largest member state um, of the European Union, needs to step up. It needs to develop a strategic mindset, which is sometimes sorely missing in Berlin. Um, doing this requires resources. Um, and doing it also requires, which is one chapter of this report, a better apparatus for decision making in national security, um, better coordination, um, and all these things. Um, on that basis, and working closely with partners such as France and Poland, um, we can get the job done, in our opinion, and preserve the fundamentals of our European and Western model, which are democracy, the rule of law, open societies, and market economies. Because at the end of the day, foreign policy today is about defending those fundamentals, and it will take everything we've got. And with that, I would hand over to Tobias. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let me echo what um, Boris just said. So we are really grateful for the opportunity to discuss our report with our neighbors in Warsaw, even if unfortunately uh, only via Zoom today. Um, actually, we're coming full circle in a certain sense because feedback from abroad was in a way the starting point for this report. For a number of years now, um, more and more participants in our Munich Security Conference event, events came with questions about Germany's role. And Germany was certainly confronted with rising expectations. At the MSC, we were in a way used to discuss international threats and challenges, used to analyze and debate the world, but we increasingly had the feeling that it was time for some introspection, so to say. Because one could argue that for many of the things that we discussed at our events, Germany, at least from the perspective of some of our guests, wasn't part of the solution, but increasingly part of the problem. So we thought it would make sense to, to change our focus a bit and, and work on a report that would not focus so much on the outside world, but rather on Germany itself. And as Ambassadors Uge and, and Freitag von Lohenhofen uh, said it's not that Germany isn't changing at all. It is. And in many ways, it has come a long, long way. In particular, I believe this is true for uh, some of the concerns that people in Poland have had for a long time. Um, think about the fact, for instance, that Germany is the only continental European member state that leads a multinational battalion on the eastern flank. Um, or its engagement as part of the VJTF, or the fact that we likely wouldn't have extended the EU sanctions against Russia had it not been for uh, German leadership. And even on the notorious defense spending issue, Germany has begun to change track. So we've seen a 40% increase in defense spending since 2014. Thing is, the world is changing much, much faster and it's not clear uh, whether we are keeping up. The liberal international order, as was just said, largely shaped by the United States and guaranteed for decades has come under pressure. So the, what, what Ambassador Freitag von Lohenhofen mentioned, what we call the foreign policy certainties on which um, German foreign policy of the past decades was based have become fragile or have disintegrated. And this Zeitenwinde in, in world politics represents, we believe a particularly great challenge for Germany because hardly any other country in the world had adapted so well to the international, to the liberal international order, politically, economically, militarily, but also intellectually. 
And if you want to pick up uh, an analogy from, from the field of ecology, one could say that for a long time, the liberal international order was the perfect habitat for the very special species of the Federal Republic, which as a civilian power and a trading state had adapted perfectly to the conditions that were in the end essentially guaranteed by others, mainly the United States. But this habitat is changing. Um, the jungle is growing back, uh, Bob Kagan writes, and Francois Esbourg uh, speaks of le temps des prédateurs, so the time of the predators. In, in short, it, it's, it's uh, becoming much more uh, uncomfortable uh, for us. And in a way, our geopolitical business model does not work anymore. So the country is still struggling with its changing role in Europe and beyond. It has to confront the erosion of the main political uh, certainties its foreign policy has been based on, and it has to adapt. It has to learn and also to unlearn uh, some of the truisms that have guided our foreign policy for so many years. And that may actually explain why it may take longer than many neighbors would like. So our report, as, as Boris said, had two main goals. So first it was meant as a stock taking exercise. And I of course encourage you to have a look at the report, look at uh, the chapters that deal with the dependencies of uh, our country, the investments, uh, public opinion, and the decision-making structures in German foreign and security policy. We look at first in the first chapter at our economic, political, and security dependencies that result from Germany's integration in the liberal order. In a way, Germany is way more integrated than other countries into the world economy. It has benefited tremendously from this order, but it stands to, lo to lose much more um, as well. Um, the second check, chapter looks at our investments into defense, diplomacy, and development. Here again, as I mentioned before, we have seen remarkable increases in, in recent years, but as we argue, it's not yet enough. The third chapter deals with German public opinion. Here too, uh, you can see that German, German public opinion has evolved uh, significantly. It's also clear that the German population senses that uh, more uh, difficult times um, are to come. 75% believe there will be more crises in the future. But you also see that some of uh, the core tenets of, of German public opinion remain very powerful and only change very slowly. Germans are multilateralists, but they are also anti-militarists. Anti and these two convictions may contradict um, each other. The fourth uh, chapter deals with the institutional structure of German foreign and security policy. And arguably, we are still working more or less with the structure that was designed in the early years of the Federal Republic uh, when a gentleman named uh, Konrad Adenauer was the chancellor. Here again, there is clearly uh, some need for reform if we want to keep up with the times. The final chapter then lays out our vision of the enabling power that Boris just described. So that was the stock exercise, our first goal. And the second was, of course, um, that this report was meant as a, to serve as a wake-up call, um, emphasizing the fact that there's more to be done. We're facing the end of the Merkel era as the chancellor who has shaped uh, German politics for 15 years is leaving the chancellor's office uh, next year. And what we would like to see is a more intense debate in Germany now about some of the most pressing concerns in this field in the run-up to the next elections in September 2021, because we believe that the, the best recipe for coming up with the, the solutions is a vibrant debate in, in our society. That's also something that can and, and must be improved in, in Germany. And speaking of um, the importance of debating uh, foreign policy, um, I look forward uh, to the debate today. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Boris and, and Tobias. And I'm sure that uh, we'll go into the, the details uh, of, of the report uh, and some of the issues that you mentioned uh, throughout the, the discussion. Uh, let me now turn to the, to the Polish uh, panelists, uh, starting with uh, Justyna <coughs> Godkowska, 
uh, who is the coordinator of the regional security uh, program at the Center for Eastern Studies. Justina, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for inviting me uh, to uh, share my thoughts on German foreign and security policy. Um, and uh, I think, uh, and on the, on the Munich Security Conference report, uh, I think it's a great one. Uh, I agree with uh, Director Dembski. Uh, it's a long one to read, uh, but, I, but I fully recommend uh, reading it. And uh, I do agree with the um, statement that uh, it moves the, the debate on Germany's international role forward. Um, and um, I would like to um, comment in my presentation uh, on um, how I see foreign and, uh, and security policy changes in Germany uh, a bit on a general level. Uh, and I think uh, we miss this level when we analyze Germany uh, often uh, here in Poland. Um, and I think I will repeat certain uh, statements that, that have been made, but I think um, I, I give, I, I will try to give also a, a different light uh, on how I see uh, uh, Germany evolving. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say that Germany is a status quo power, uh, which uh, is uh, written uh, in the report. And uh, this being status quo power makes Germany so difficult uh, to embrace the changes. Germany has uh, enormously profited from the liberal world order created by the US. Uh, it has greatly profited um, uh, from the globalization. It is enormously profited from the European integration and enlargement uh, through Eurozone, Schengen zones, single market, freedom of movement. Um, and it has become, become prosperous in economic terms, secure in military terms, and gained on a political cloud in the, in the hetero model uh, of, uh, in, uh, of functioning in the liberal uh, uh, world, uh, world order. Uh, and German answers until now has been thus uh, slow uh, to see and reluct reluctant to react to this, cha this international change, uh, as Germany has not been directly affected. Ambassador Ruger said Germany policy is evolving, but the world is evolving faster. And I think that is a very well statement uh, on the German uh, uh, foreign uh, and security policy uh, changes. Um, I think that there were not the Germans, but the Allies who started to feel the changes, the US on the global level, but also the Southern member states, Poland and the Baltic states on the Eastern flank, with China certainly ascending, with Russia aggressively fighting to remain relevant, with Southern neighborhood being in turmoil, and with the US relatively, a power relatively descending and demanding more from, from the Allies. Um, all this is changing the rules of the Hitler's game and puts questions about the functioning of the German political, economic and security policy model. Uh, and Germany is right now and will be under great pressure, not only from the US with regard to China, but also from its European allies as represented by France and Poland that put actually pretty contradictory demands on Berlin uh, in many issues with regard to the um, future of European integration, with regard to future of transatlantic relations, with regard to, uh, to more uh, of uh, more military engagement, uh, either in the South or in the, or in the East. Uh, and uh, the German model of heterative functioning, I, um, I would call a, a kind of a balancing one. Uh, one trying to combine European integration and close relations to France with transatlanticism, with close uh, relations to the US. Uh, one that uh, is trying to manage interests of the Southern EU member states represented by France and Eastern Northern ones uh, represented also by Poland. Uh, Germany uh, uh, has been being a part of the West has been uh, in the past years heavily uh, reaching out to Russia and sometimes even uh, in the past trying uh, to play a med mediator between the US uh, and Russia due to history and energy and economic interest. Uh, Germany being part of the West has also in the re recent years uh, uh, been reaching out to China due to uh, German uh, uh, economic interests and economic relations with this country. And what is happening now in Germany from my perspective is a struggle 
on what should be maintained from this model, what should be reformed and how, and what should be changed and discarded in, uh, 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 in this framework. And the struggle is between European sovereignists and Atlantis uh, uh, on the one hand and Atlanticists on the other. And uh, we have observed the, the recent exchange of articles and speeches between the uh, Annegret uh, Kramp Karrenbauer, the CDU defense minister, and the SPD foreign minister, uh, Heiko Maas, and the rep some representative of the Green Party. Uh, I think it's also a struggle between uh, those who support uh, sort of core Europe and uh, ideas and, and uh, uh, more uh, strengthened Franco-German cooperation and those who are supporters of cohesion uh, in all of the EU and who are aware that Central and Eastern Europe is important to Germany. I think it's also a struggle between those who see the need of uh, more military engagement on part of Germany in security policy and those who see diplomacy and civilian instruments as the primary ones. Uh, there is a struggle of, uh, of those who see the need to stand up more to, uh, decisively towards aggressive uh, Russia and scrap the Nord Stream 2 project and those who want to come back to business as usual. And finally, there is a struggle on how to see China, whether it is a challenge and a threat to the, uh, to the West in the long term, um, uh, as seen by some and uh, those uh, in Germany who prefer uh, the, the short-term economic gains of, uh, of uh, the relations uh, with China. And I think in all the, in this uh, German struggle, the fault lines um, go often across the party lines. And this struggle is difficult, um, uh, even more difficult, if you look to the uh, objective limitations uh, of uh, um, uh, developing German foreign and security policy further. Uh, since Germany is a risk and conflict averse country, Germany is globally interconnected economy. Uh, Germany is a middle power, actually, regional power, uh, from a global perspective. And Germany, uh, what Tobias mentioned, and is domestic, uh, domestically in an end of a political era with Merkel gone in one year, and with a changing uh, society and a changing political scene. Uh, and all this tells me that um, Germany will not move decisively in one or the other direction in the coming years. The discussion and, and struggle uh, uh, will continue and uh, Germany will neither go towards uh, or embrace the European strategic uh, autonomy, nor will decide uh, uh, decisively and embrace uh, uh, transatlanticism. Um, also, uh, I think the preference for strengthening the EU as a, also in security and defense has been made on part of the, of the German uh, political elite. And uh, neither Germany will, uh, will go uh, for a tougher policy towards Russia that Poland expects, but also but, uh, it will not go for, for a reset. And Germany will also not go for it, decoupling and containing China as the US wanted. Germany was against the Trump's approach of great power rivalry. And uh, right now, I think it is also cautious with Biden's uh, um, administration approach of uh, democracy versus uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, and I think also that Germany will not start um, a path towards a decisive military engagement either in, in the south or in the east. Uh, also, it will further strengthen uh, its, its military, military uh, engagement uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so what I see is Germany struggling in its internal debate uh, in the foreseeable future. And I see Na Europe and NATO struggling uh, with Germany. Uh, so uh, that will be neither French uh, strategic autonomy nor Polish embrace of trans transatlanticism. Germany will have to find uh, its path, but I think uh, it will be a long time um, uh, for Germany uh, to do so. And um, to conclude, I think we in Poland uh, need to have a larger stake in the German intern current internal debates in order to push forward the discussion on the need uh, to, of uh, transatlanticism, on the need of maintaining strong relations with the US um, that is so important to the Central and Eastern Europe. And I think we need to push forward the discussion on the need of necessary changes in security pol uh, policy discussions uh, uh, in Germany.
And I will stop here uh, and uh, let Martin um, develop his thoughts on uh, German, uh, in detail on German uh, security uh, and uh, defense policy. And I'm happy uh, to, to have a, a discussion uh, afterwards. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Justyna. Um, this was this a bit sobering uh, on the inability of German Germany to to to, to decide. Um, and if we can talk about the the challenges, uh, one challenge which I have is a kind of circular character of the German discussion on security issues when it seems almost seems like something is decided, and then all of a sudden. It's back to square one and first principles are again uh, being um, discussed. So indeed, I, I, I hope that we can also discuss further on the ways that we can perhaps uh, help Germany uh, to, to move ahead uh, with, uh, with, with, this, uh, with this policy, uh, policy formation. Uh, but first, uh, I will now turn to Marcin Terlikowski, uh, PISM's uh, own head of the International Security Program. Thank you, Lukasz. And uh, let me start uh, like, like Justyna with um, uh, congratulating the Munich Security Conference team. Uh, a great report, a big one, but at the same time thought-provoking and uh, and uh, and deep in, in 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 the scale of research. It's really uh, easy to to recognize how much effort it took to uh, to produce it, uh, and indeed it is, it is inspiring. So uh, what uh, I would like to do is to uh, say uh, how the issues um, which are discussed in the report very much German. Uh, internal issues are seen from outside because basically they, they do have effects on, on, on outside world. And in this sense, of course, I will speak from, 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 my, from myself, from my experience, my observations, but also try to, try to allude to, to uh, and report on, on how these this, um, um, uh, issues are seen from, from Poland and the broader region. Um, speaking mostly about, about easternmost uh, EU member states and NATO allies, so, so what we often refer to as the Eastern flag. So basically, the, the report speaks about a new era uh, and the new challenges uh, for Germany in their security and foreign policy. But actually, it is not, uh, I would dare to say, it is not about Germany at all. Uh, it is seen as a re these issues, which the report discusses, are seen as the issues of the vital importance for the future of the European Union. Uh, this is about how European Union will position itself in the world uh, which is increasingly multipolar, which, uh, in which you have changing foreign policy of the US, you have a revisionist uh, Russia posing challenges and threats to the transatlantic world, to US and, and, and Europe. And we have um, China, which has arisen as an economic power at the same time able to, uh, to undermine core security and strategic interests of, of again, Europe and, and, and the US. So um, in this sense, the report uh, speaking about uh, Germany and, and uh, about how Germany should respond to this um, uh, Zeitenwende, the change of the turn of eras, the, the change of times, or the paradigm shift as, as um, um, Boris said, uh, this uh, is actually what will decide about the future of the European Union. Uh, and looking at uh, what's happening inside of, or what will happen inside of the European Union, this is also about uh, the future of the German relation with France, which used to be the core of the European Union, the, the, the motor, the engine of the, of the European Union. Uh, so this is how I read these questions, and I guess, uh, and I have good reasons to believe that this is how the questions which are posed uh, by the, and answered by the, rep, uh, the, the report uh, are read. So it's, uh, it's about Germany, but not at all only about Germany, I would even say, dare to say that it's more, more, more importantly about, about European Union. Now, uh, the report uh, departs from, from, from the assumption that it is important to uh, look what Germany achieved since 2014, since the Munich Consensus proclaimed and, and, and announced by the top uh, German officials 
Um, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, the, let's say outside world, so the German allies in NATO, the, 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 the German partners in the European Union do recognize the change, do recognize that, that Germany became more active in security and defense. This is my area of research, so I can speak about this very much. We do see that Germany involved heavily in the Eastern flank being one of the four framework nations and the only continental European nation to decide to, to, to play this role in Lithuania. Um, we can see the German military engagement in, in Africa uh, in support of stabilization effort, efforts there. Uh, less visible, but very important and potentially far reaching um, uh, German uh, effort is within the NATO's framework nation concept. So Germany developing partnership with a number of countries from the Central and Eastern Europe, NATO members, uh, I mean, uh, in order to, to build more interoperability and enable more swift reaction of NATO to contingencies, which may, which may uh, uh, happen here in the Eastern flank, of course, contingencies um, uh, involving Russia. And, and this is all, all very much uh, acknowledged and, and recognized. Um, just like German policy in the EU, the fact that it was Germany who, who made the permanent structured cooperation mechanism, the flagship uh, um, uh, fruit of the European global strategy from 2016, uh, look like it is looking now. So being an inclusive mechanism, which did not bring divisions in Europe, but actually cemented member states uh, around a single, uh, 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 under a single umbrella uh, to, 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 to boost defense cooperation and boost capabilities. We know that it was because of Germany that this vision of PESCO as a and as a tool which is inclusive and, and flexible, prevailed and enabled uh, countries like, like Poland uh, to join uh, with no uh, big, uh, big um, um, uh, doubts about legitimacy and, and the goals of PESCO. Uh, finally, what is recognized is also German change um, of attitude towards Russia, or at least the, the, the fact that the German government, German political elite, but also German society increasingly understands that Russia does pose an existential threat to Europe. Uh, although we may still differ in, 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 the, prescrip in the prescription, so in, in, in assessment of tools which should be deployed to, to, to actually deal with this, with this threat. Uh, and finally, what to do with it, what we expect from Germany, because the, the, the report again says very lot, a lot of uh, about about what Germany, uh, what are the tasks of Germany um, um, in this uh, change times, in this in this uh, Zeitenwende? Uh, and uh, here again, I would like to say what is seen as things to be done by Germany. And uh, I would like to touch on the on the very uh, notion from the report, which which says that uh, that Germany has to solve the German question in the modern form. So the issue that if there is too little German leadership in Europe, Germany will be accused of being a reluctant uh, a power, a reluctant power in, in um, um, a, a reluctant EU member states, not willing to use its, um, its, its um, uh, political and, and economic and military capacity to lead the EU. But if Germany at the same time does too much, then there will be skepticism and, and reluctance to actually accept um, uh, German proposals as seen uh, as um, uh, being, being uh, uh, kind of imposed on, on other states. I'm kind of referring to what the report is saying now. And uh, in this, in this uh, spirit, I'd like to say that, uh, in this context, I'd like to say that um, it is now clear that, that uh, German leadership is needed and is welcomed in the EU, but at the same time, it has to be, um, it, we have to depart from the narrative we had in 2012, 2013, 2014, when, when there was a full stop after the call for German leadership. So the, the think tank words, the commentators from the media, also some political leaders were saying that we need more Germany full stop. Now I, I would, change this full stop into a comma and say that we want, we, we expect German leadership, but a leadership which will be rooted um, in, a, in a kind of a concept 
that Germany is a, is a guardian of the principle that the European Union, the European integration should serve all member states, which should be equal in the chances to get opportunities and benefits and obligations stemming from the fact that we, that we uh, are building the European Union together. So what I'm trying to say is that um, Germany should, uh, is should it sh the Germany is expected to uh, go above what used to determine uh, its approach to foreign security policy over the, la of the, the last uh, five, six years, which was its own perceptions of the transatlantic bond, its own perception and the, and the huge importance of the uh, bond with France and the importance of the Franco-German engine. And Germany should actually try to build more um, into its own uh, uh, program of foreign policy into its own actions, which we will undertake in its foreign security policy, the interests and the sensitivities, the legitimate threat perceptions and concerns of many other states. I'm not saying that Germany did not do it, but in very many areas we had the, uh, we had, the, there was, uh, it was widely commented in the media, there was an, uh, there was an impression that it was again a Franco-German tandem or, or Germany um, uh, or the German, or the function of German US strained relations, to say the least, under Trump, that was influencing what was happening in Europe. Germany, to become successful in this uh, Zeitenwende, in this new era, would have to be an ambassador of a whole variety of interests, sensitivities uh, of all EU member states, and this way becoming uh, ultimately successful, I would argue. And I think I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, the uh, German needs to do more now with an asterisk uh, explaining exactly what Germany uh, should do. Uh, with uh, this, uh, let me uh, open up uh, the discussion. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, remind uh, the, our, uh, the, those who watch or listen on, on YouTube, on uh, Twitter, uh, on Facebook, that you can write down your questions and uh, we'll try to bring them on uh, into the uh, discussion. Uh, for uh, We have also uh, the, the, the Zoom participants uh, and I already have uh, some questions, uh, but uh, I would uh, also encourage you to have uh, comments uh, and maybe uh, present your own uh, assessments uh, of uh, where we are, whether we in Poland feel, feel this site and bend in the same way uh, that our colleagues from uh, Munich are describing it. Um, and especially if there are some uh, areas in the report on the assessment with which uh, you uh, uh, disagree with, uh, to also uh, make this, this discussion kind of better visible on, uh, on, on, on the outside, um, uh, I'll be uh, asking uh, people uh, from uh, the, our Zoom group uh, to, to, to prepare and to speak uh, live. Um, and then I will, uh, I will come back uh, to, uh, to, to Boris and to uh, uh, Tobias. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I will just ask uh, uh, our German colleagues uh, to perhaps respond and comment to some of the points uh, which they made by Justena uh, and by, by Martin. Uh, so uh, Boris, I guess it's, it's first over to you. Great. Um, let's see, can I, I can't switch my video on right now. Lukash? Okay. We can hear you. Oh, Lovely. it's better now. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So, so thank you very much to Justina and, and Martin for their, their, their excellent points. It was a, it was a pleasure to, to listen and to think about what you were saying. Um, and I, I want to just react to a few points. Um, on the issue of um, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer and Emmanuel Macron and sovereignty and strategic autonomy, 
I'll leave that to to, to be us. Um, I think he he can he can go into some of those points. I think Martin was quite right to say that, in a sense, we think um, we were looking at this in a European framework. And why were we doing that? We were doing that because we believe that Germany, um, despite being the largest EU member state, is simply too small um, to deal with those big challenges on its own. The only chance we have to get a handle on this is by working through the European Union, making the European Union a geopolitical, geoeconomic actor, and of course, maintaining a very strong transatlantic um, relationship and to keep the US by our side, especially, but not only on, on security issues. Um, I thought what was very interesting in Justina's um, um, uh, presentation was, of course, the analysis that given Germany's makeup, um, our way of thinking, our political dynamics, that um, despite all of the good ideas in our report, um, things are unlikely to change in a significant or dramatic fashion. Um, but I think you might be wrong on this one, Justina. I think um, sort of arguing, um, you know, if you look at the past um, and if you look at the present even, you could say, well, nothing will change. But I think there's a chance that things will in fact change. And this is based on, on the conversations we've had also. Um, I think the, the need for evolving is so pressing um, and will become increasingly evident um, in the German political debate and also to citizens. If you look at the, the polling we did for this report, um, citizens are aware that um, there's a lot of pressure out there. They follow international events. Um, they take an interest, they form an opinion. To give one example, the standing of China has deteriorated in a big way, not just in Germany, but across Europe. And that is because people are following along and they're drawing their conclusions. But I, where I think we have a chance of evolving um, is, is, um, is a separate point, and that is, uh, in a sense, leadership and debate. I think what has been missing in Germany to some extent is um, the top levels of government embracing these issues and talking about these issues and explaining these issues to a wider audience. It's particularly stark when you look at the issue of nuclear deterrence, uh, which does not figure in the German uh, public debate, um, where the field is left um, to, to people who are looking for global zero, which is a very honorable objective, but one that is unlikely to be realized. So I think um, if we end up with more debate, and I, I see that happening, I think we have a chance of, of moving ahead. And in the same vein, if you look at the issue of China, there was a very interesting paper from the Social Democratic Parliamentary Group in the Bundestag um, on China, which took a very, very tough line, much tougher than the, the, the government line so far on China, um, a sober look at how China under Xi Jinping has evolved, um, the threats it presents, and how we should respond to that. Um, and, and that gives me the sense that our debate is moving along, and we have some people out there, in, in particularly in, in Parliament, um, who are willing to identify these issues and put ideas on the table. So, so much for me. And once again, many thanks to both of you for your excellent comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tobias, uh, would you like uh, to uh, add something at this point? Sure, um, maybe just a few comments. So um, thank you um, very much for, for the comments. Um, from uh, Justina and, and Martin, that was really interesting. Um, I, I would like to, to comment maybe just on, on one or two of them. Um, I think uh, Lukas, you said that uh, you, you sometimes had the feeling that the German debate had a kind of a circular character, I like that um, uh, expression. And that's also uh, some of the frustration that I often had when, when looking at uh, the debate in my own country. But um, let me say, and I think Boris is, is right on this one, uh, the, the, the circle in, in that sense is, is moving in a way. So it's always two, two steps forward, uh, one step uh, backward maybe. Um, it's it's um, sometimes frustrating, but at least it's, it's changing in, in the right direction. What we could say, and I, I think um, Boris made the point uh, concerning uh, China, this is something where there has been tremendous change in, in 
in let's say the the past two years or so. Um, the same is true for for our uh, approach uh, toward Russia. I think that there also has been tremendous change. There are always people who would like to go back to business as as usual, but in the general uh, sense, I think we've we've seen a lot of um, positive development here. Um, to me, what is really interesting is how Germany will now react to the Biden presidency. And I believe that our country has a, a tremendous uh, responsibility to encourage a constructive uh, transatlantic debate on the new uh, transatlantic bargain that is to be struck um, with the Biden presidency. Um, and I, I believe we are um, not only geographically, but also intellectually, conceptually, somewhere um, between the French position and the Polish position. And that may be just uh, the German um, responsibility to, to strike uh, a compromise between these two positions. Because on the one hand, um, people in Germany, I believe, have, have concluded from the very narrow um, election in the United States and the behavior of uh, the Republicans in, in the ongoing discussions now, that of course there is a serious concern that Trumpism will not go away, but basically stay with us. And that it's just not okay to put all your eggs in just one basket, if I may say so, and just count fully on, on uh, the United States as the main, uh, main guarantor of European security in the long run. So we need to do more. And uh, on the other hand, um, we, we also believe um, that, what, um, that some of the ideas that um, um, President Macron is, is pushing for um, go far beyond what is sensible because in, in as, as uh, our Minister of Defense just uh, reiterated, there is just no possible scenario that the Europeans could defend themselves within the next uh, one or two uh, decades. Uh, so we need the United States and it's in our interest to, to keep the United States engaged in Europe. But as, as Boris also just said, uh, we believe that in the short to medium term, there is no contradiction um, because we need to invest in capabilities. We need to do more as Europeans and this is both in the interest of stronger transatlantic relations and also in the interest of increased European, um, whether you call it sovereignty or whatsoever, but there's, there's something uh, that needs to be done. And in a way, I believe um, a lot of, um, um, or, or the debate will really uh, depend on, on a constructive uh, German engagement um, with this debate that, that um, delivers uh, capabilities and engagement um, in, in European defense. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, and indeed, it seems to me that uh, 80, maybe 90% of those who participate in this debates uh, about transatlanticism versus sovereignists uh, are actually in a very intense and very violent agreement uh, with uh, each other. And uh, sometimes it seems that some of the points are made just for the sake of uh, having a, a good op-ed, uh, whereas there is a lot of this uh, common, common ground when I think both Poland and Germany would feel uh, very comfortable. Uh, I have now a, a number of people uh, on my list uh, who want to ask questions or make comments. In this round, I'll go first to uh, Wojtek Lorenz, then to Alexandra Gastold, and then to Michal Baranowski. Uh, and as I said, I invite you to, to, to speak and uh, switch on uh, not only the microphone, uh, but also uh, the video. Uh, so Wojtek, the, the floor is yours. And if we don't have Wojtek, uh, then I would go to, to Alexandra Gastold.
Hello, you can hear me now, probably. Yes, we okay. can. So, um, uh, actually, okay, I'm in. Bo Boris, Hi. Boris partially partially answered this uh, this question. I have put it a little bit earlier to the uh, chat, but uh, anyway, I will I will maybe get some more details because it seems that to move Germany's um, adjustment to strategic realities, we would need a greater political consensus, especially uh, among the major political powers. And this in turn would require uh, the major shift uh, in social uh, Democrats uh, position on, on defense and security issues. And you referred to the discussion on uh, nuclear deterrence, uh, but I would like to, to ask more generally whether, whether you see such a debate in this um, party and any attempts of its leadership to, to stir the debate and influence its uh, base, which is mainly pacifist. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, apologies that it's taking uh, a little bit longer than usual. We are uh, switching uh, people on and off in this uh, debate. Uh, so uh, now uh, to, to, to Dr. Uh, Gastot. Okay, I'm in. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask about concepts and new ideas of cooperation. Uh, I'm especially interested in cooperation uh, towards uh, Ukraine and uh, in frames of the Eastern Partnership, because I have observed that some ideas ended uh, a few years ago and uh, the idea of closer acquaintance is on the wane and uh, perhaps joint efforts to stabilize uh, the situation in the Ukraine may be a platform for closer and deepen cooperation or rather for competition uh, between Germany and Poland. And uh, what do you think about um, elaboration of new mechanism uh, within the Eastern uh, Partnership? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will now try to go to, to Michal Baranowski. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I will manage right. to have both audio and video. Oh, there he is. I, I, uh, there we go. I'm at, oh, perfect. Great. It worked. Technology. Um, Great to be with you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lukas, and uh, great to see you, uh, Boris and Tobias and, and everyone else. So uh, w one quick comment, I, I, and it's great to hear, uh, Boris, you, your pushback on, on Justyna, that in fact the, uh, the debate in Germany is moving forward. Uh, I think, I think uh, she is representing quite a few views here in Warsaw that where we look forward to this to this movement. Uh, so that's uh, you know one one comment. The other comment also to you, to Justina, I think you know uh, you you sort of uh, snack in there one very important point, which is that Poland needs to be much of a voice in the German debate and much you know we have so much at stake in what's going on, and in fact we are a little bit tugging. On, uh, on Germany along with France, but from the opposite direction. So I, I'm really glad that we have this conversation uh, where we are able to, to, to do a little bit of this tugging and, and uh, put, put ourselves, um, uh, you know, have this conversation in Warsaw. The question that I have um, actually to both uh, Boris and Tobias and then, you know, to Justyna, uh, or, or and Martin, or, or one of the two of you. I mean, we, we began uh, talking a little bit about what Biden's administration uh, could meet um, for, for transatlantic cooperation, but I kind of want to raise again the question that uh, Ambassador raised in the very beginning, which is more precise. What does the Biden's administration, uh, what it could mean for Polish-German cooperation? And, uh, and I wanted to, to make, you know, please have it as an open one, but let, let me throw an idea and, and test it on you a little bit. 
both on the German side and on the, the political side, uh, on the Polish side. Um, uh, U.S. is clearly going to look for more of uh, um, input and capabilities from uh, from the European side, uh, and it, this is going to be beyond just the spending. It's going to be the fo focus on the burden sharing debate will be on on capabilities. Germany is going to look for a renewal of security relationship with um, with the US, uh, also undoing the announcements that that Trump has done uh, in the middle of the year uh, in terms of withdrawing US troops. And Poland um, needs actually to both maintain good security relationship with, with the US, increase NATO capabilities on the Eastern flank, and we need Germany in all this. So the question here is, would you see uh, how viable would be an idea both in Germany and in Poland to have uh, ger more German troops deployed in Poland on the eastern flank, perhaps together with Americans, to sort of to sort of capture uh, and answer all those three interests from the from the three countries. For Germany, uh, do you think this idea would sell in, in Berlin? And for for Polish uh, speakers, whether this would uh, sell, uh, you know, work well in Warsaw, both for security reasons, but also for, for political reasons. Thank you, Łukasz. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will now go back uh, to, to the panel. Of course, we'll have uh, the next rounds uh, of comments uh, and uh, question. Uh, and um, maybe uh, let's start again with the, with the German uh, colleagues uh, with uh, uh, with Boris, um, and and then we'll move to, to to the Polish panelists. Thanks very much for the the, the questions and the comments so far. Um, to to um, respond to to Wojtek, so how what about the German debate? Um, I think what is interesting about the German debate is that we have someone like Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer um, as Minister of Defense, who has been very outspoken um, on some of the critical issues. For example, who has had two speeches in recent times where she has spoken about nuclear deterrence and nuclear sharing very prominently. It's not something that um, the uh, political level in Germany has a habit of doing, but she's addressing these issues. She's going out, she's engaging. I think that's encouraging. Um, across political parties, and this goes back to a point I think um, Justina made, um, you have um, um, a debate on China in particular. And, and, and across political parties, uh, conservatives, social democrats, greens, liberals, certainly, um, you have people who are articulating a very critical view of China and who are part of a debate that is moving, moving the, the ball, if you like. I, I referenced the Social Democratic um, paper from the parliamentary group in the Bundestag. Um, but you will see that the Greens um, are very critical, very outspoken um, on China, but also on Russia. So there's a debate that is going on where the challenges are reflected and where the return of great power competition is recognized. And I think that's very important. And I think um, what we need is precisely that kind of debate. We need leadership. Um, we need the political level to explain the realities um, of this and to put forward a, um, a response. And I think that will, that will take us forward. And, and of course, if you look at the polls right now um, and over the past, say, six months, what you have in those polls is ultimately um, a majority in parliament, if you extrapolate, for a conservative green coalition. Um, so unless the conservatives and the social democrats were to continue their grand coalition, which right now appears very unlikely, the only other option reflected in the polls right now um, is a conservative green coalition. So much would depend on, on how the Greens position themselves. Um, and I think we can, we can see some interesting movement there. Of course, um, with the Green Party, um, on the one hand, you have a very critical view, which is in part led by 
um, a, uh, a reflection and an importance given to human rights, very critical view on China and Russia. Uh, but of course, you have a large part of the Green Party that is not exactly enthusiastic about, about um, military force, the use of force, defense spending. But keep in mind, again, leadership, think back to 1998, 99, where you had a red-green government um, in Bonn at the time that led us into the Kosovo War, which was the first combat um, operation of German soldiers since World War II. Right? And that was someone like Joschka Fischer leading his party, making the case, and successfully so. Um, very briefly to Alexandra, I think um, the, the discussion we're having today um, suggests to me that, um, that Germans and Poles ought to have discussions all the time about these critical issues, in particular regarding Ukraine and the Eastern Partnership. And one element, um, since you asked about new mechanisms, one element that I think is absolutely critical is a conversation between members of parliament. I think it's extremely important also because we're heading into this national election in 2021 and we will have a new government coming out of that, presumably based on a new coalition. I can only recommend intensifying the dialogue between German and Polish members of parliament on questions of, of security um, and defense. And finally, to Michal's um, question, I think that's a really good question. I think, um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's very much worth exploring. And, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and not take up more time. Uh, thank you very much. In the spirit of uh, mixing Polish and German voices, I will now turn to Justyna, then to Tobias, and then to Marcin. So Justyna, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ruga, for the pushback uh, and the optimistic view uh, towards my statement. I must say that I see the de development, but I also, I also see the struggle. And I think the struggle is especially visible in the security and, and defense issues. Uh, we have, on the one hand, uh, Annegret Kramp Karenbauer, who is very, right now, very voiceful. Uh, with uh, her speeches, her uh, articles, uh, but uh, we shall remember that AKK is uh, only part of the Conservative Party and we'll see who will become the next party leader. And I think this will also uh, be important in the next, having in mind the next, uh, the next government. Uh, with regards to SPD and the consensus that Wojtek uh, Lorenz talked about that is needed to push uh, uh, German security and defense policy forward, we see that the party and the, Bundes uh, the, uh, the uh, Bundestag group is uh, uh, going uh, or is, is beginning to be dominated by um, a pacifist wing a wing that has actually uh, been very voiceful against uh, uh, further German participation in the nuclear uh, sharing uh, in NATO. Um, we uh, have the Greens uh, with also, with being, uh, uh, with favoring a tougher stance towards Russia and China that you rightfully mentioned, but at the same time, uh, being against uh, uh, nuclear sharing, uh, being for uh, removal of uh, US nuclear weapons uh, from Germany. And if I rightly remember, uh, there was also a motion, a green motion um, uh, in the Bundestag uh, um, uh, exactly about this issue. Uh, the Greens are also uh, rather against defense spending. And if you look at the polls that you have in, in, the, in the report, uh, I think it's um, the only 40% of uh, green um, uh, supporters um, who favor um, any um, uh, further, uh, uh, further investment uh, in security and defense. Uh, so I see here, especially in, the, in security and defense issues, um, uh, a struggle between the parties, uh, and uh, I don't see the consensus, a cons consensus that would move Germany decisively forward. Uh, and I think uh, we should acknowledge that and we should be ready also to deal with such a Germany uh, after the elections. 
Um, with re but I favor very much what um, uh, Michal Baranowski said. We need to be much more present in the German debate. We need to engage, especially with the Green Party, but also with the SPD. Um, and uh, before the elections and after the elections, and we need uh, uh, a trilateral uh, cooperation uh, between US, Germany and Poland. And I think this issue is uh, difficult for both countries, uh, for Poland because of the current political situation, uh, the priority of the cooperation with, uh, with uh, the US, the difficulties in the Polish-German relations, in Germany, because uh, such a trilateral cooperation beyond the NATO framework is difficult uh, to uh, gain traction in Germany. Nevertheless, I think we should favor that. We should favor um, German engagement uh, and additional troops on the Eastern flank operating uh, either in NATO format or beyond uh, with US and Polish troops. Uh, we shall favor uh, additional German uh, assets such as air defense on the eastern flank, flank exercising uh, with Polish, Swedish, uh, Romanian uh, Patriot batteries in the future. We need, for example, an investment uh, uh, program of Germany to co-finance co a military infrastructure. Um, as uh, Germany is already doing this uh, in Lithuania. And I think we can think of many, um, uh, many other ideas how to develop this cooperation on the Eastern flank and how to show that Germany takes that additional responsibility and engages here towards the, the Biden administration. I think it's important to focus right now on concrete proposals, concrete issues where we can cooperate. And I think we as experts in security and defense issues in the Polish-German, Polish-US or German-US uh, relations, I think we have a role now. We have a role now to convince our own publics and our political elites that such a cooperation is very much needed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Tobias. I would just say that one of the Deadlines uh, might be the Munich Security Conference, uh, where a number of good ideas were launched in the in the past. Yeah, hopefully we'll have a new headlines soon. Um, but um, I would like to pick up um, something that uh, Michal uh, said. So the the notion of of tugging and and friendly tugging is is. Um, what I believe is really necessary um, also for the German debate, because as, as many now rightly pointed out, there are ongoing debates about Germany's uh, foreign and security policy posture in almost any uh, German party, whether it's the Green Party or the Social Democrats, even in the CDU and CSU. Um, so it's, it's really important in that debate that we have friends from abroad who also intervene in these debates and, and provide some friendly tugging, so to say, um, to uh, influence um, our debate in, um, in Germany. Um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can. OK, OK. Sorry, I, the, the, there seem to be some issues here. Sorry. Um, so we, we need Polish um, voices in the debate because as, as was rightly pointed out, um, there has been a pacifist turn in, in parts of the SPD, for instance, and our debate sometimes is so um, in a way self-centered that the new uh, chairwoman of the Social Democratic Party, for instance, made uh, the, the case that um, basically our neighbors would oppose more German defense spending. Um, not 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 actually talking or listening to to our neighbors, but just stating it as a fact. So in that sense, it's helpful if we have people from abroad um, taking part in in that debate and also driving home the point that more German defense spending, more German defense engagement is actually something that our neighbors want. Then it's uh, that's my second point. It's a matter of framing, I believe. It probably doesn't make sense. To, uh, to focus so much on the nuclear issue of nuclear sharing. Uh, of course, that's, that's, that's the main part here. But if you, if you could just 
focus on, on the sharing aspect, on the cohesion aspect, on the aspect of keeping NATO together um, to strike a compromise here, that, that is, I believe, much more helpful. So if you can frame all these arguments in a multilateral uh, framework, if you can push the Germans to accept their role as part of a multi uh, lateral uh, organization in, in terms also of um, historical res responsibility, that is way more helpful than to focus on, on the military issues, on the nuclear issues, etc. because that makes it, I believe, more difficult for some of the politicians in Germany to actually uh, throw their, their, their political weight behind these proposals. And uh, finally, on, on, on that point, uh, uh, regarding the eastern flank, um, I remember that in, in 2014, uh, when the Americans launched um, or announced their European Reassurance Initiative, um, a Polish um, colleague and friend of mine, um, whom many of you know probably, Dominic Jankowski, and, and a, a, friend, a French friend of mine, uh, Martin Michelot, we, we just we published, I think that was in March or April, um, a, a, a small piece arguing for um, some kind of Weimar, Weimar triangle uh, multinational force that would somehow complement the American initiative to signal to the Americans that it's not just their job, but also the Europeans that would take an initiative. And, and I believe for the Germans uh, being part of such a Weimar force or any, any maybe a Polish German initiative, that is something that would go down much better than, than just saying, sending German soldiers to the Eastern flank. If they are part of a, a multinational battalion or a Weimar initiative, I think that, that would be helpful. Um, and finally, of course, there are other uh, initiatives as well. For instance, the, the multinational core Northeast that could be strengthened. And, and uh, I, I believe there are lots of opportunities and I believe right now is the time to, to have these debates and, and maybe come up with uh, something that would also go down quite well in, in Washington DC, I believe. Uh, thank you very much. I think everyone is welcomed, uh, not, not only the French when it comes to the uh, military, not only the Germans when it comes to the military presence in Poland, but I think Marcin uh, will, will talk more about it. Uh, thank you, Lukasz. I'm not sure if I can add uh, a lot to, to what has been just said, uh, because indeed there is everything you need to have more German uh, military uh, uh, engagement in Poland, in the sense that you don't really need uh, to reinvent uh, the enhanced forward presence. You just uh, can, pl can plan for more exercises and rotate some units for uh, exercises uh, and, and drills with, with American forces. And it is true not only for Germany, by the way, but also for other allies, which may benefit and use the fact that we will have an increasing number of American forces deployed to Poland, using also in some time, of course, um, some uh, facilities, infrastructure meant to, to, to provide a good uh, ground for training. And, and uh, if Tobias were saying about the paper, which I think uh, I remembered, and then I can just uh, advertise also a, Weimar, a similar Weimar proposal, which, which, I, which I wrote together with, uh, with, with Ronja Kempi von Esbub and Pierre Hausch from, from ESM last year, um, and, uh, calling for precisely more Weimar engagement into training in the Eastern flag and some other things. But, well, to complement to, the, to this discussion, I would point to two issues which were not taken. So what Germany, uh, which, which were not tackled. Uh, so what Germany can do for the Eastern flank, uh, a part of, of uh, maybe, maybe engaging more in the exercises uh, on the, within NATO or also on bilateral basis with, with Poland. Well, Germany can help advocate the vision of European defense, of PESCO European Defense Fund and all the European Union Defense Initiative, um, uh, feeding in better than, than now into the needs of, of NATO. So basically, uh, we have, uh, as I said in my uh, kickoff remarks, uh, it has been because of Germany that we have uh, PESCO, which is inclusive, which is flexible, which is linked um, uh, in the very basic documents adopted uh, formally by the Council of the EU and the European Council, uh, which make PESCO EDF uh, an instrument which cannot, should not undermine NATO, rather feed in, help um, NATO capability uh, uh, targets. Uh, 
So if this is the case, then Germany can now, with the ongoing strategic compass process, with the ongoing PESCO review, um, can help to uh, achieve this kind of uh, uh, increased, or I would say even ever increasing level of coherence between what the EU is doing in terms of defense and what NATO needs. Uh, so basically, we may, with all the respect to the idea that Europe should be doing more autonomously in defense, which is fair, and you should have to uh, know, and, and the just caveat I would have is that you need to frame it the right way because it cannot be and shouldn't be um, framed as uh, anti-US or anti-transatlantic bond project. And uh, the European pursuit of more capacity to act in defense can serve NATO and can actually increase transatlantic bond. And Germany is the right actor to, to promote this vision, particularly vis-a-vis -vis its Western neighbor. The other thing which Germany could do uh, is to steer the reflection in, help steer, help steer the reflection in, in NATO on, on what to do to enable more national uh, defenses and national potential of the NATO Mr. Most members. There has been floating around this idea of, of having some kind of a fund, so additional money uh, to help buy capabilities by uh, NATO Eastern flank allies, the capabilities which we badly need and which may be hard to be acquired since we don't know exactly the magnitude of post-COVID economic crisis on defense expenditure in Europe. So basically, if we can see the European Defense Fund being slashed by half, and actually, uh, I would uh, say and argue, uh, actually decided almost on what it will be spent because of the fact that we have big projects which will consume a lot of the, the, the budget um, uh, from, the, from the EDF, then uh, maybe we should think of something similar in NATO aimed at uh, helping uh, allies to invest into very basic capabilities which are lacking, like air missile defense or even anti-drone defense, which turns out to be to, to be decisive if we look at the military uh, um, military uh, conclusions from the from the uh, or lesser extent from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And the, uh, let me advertise PISM here as well, there will be a, 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 a report, a short report coming quickly, shortly from PISM on that by, by, Anna, by Anna Maria Diner and Arek, uh, Arkadiusz Legis, I'm sorry, and uh, very soon. So, so very ch relatively cheap technologies can be uh, used to reinforce defenses. And for that, um, uh, you may need, you may want to involve NATO in novel ways with German wave in the Alliance, uh, why not do it? So not only sending troops uh, for exercises, not only um, uh, helping to, to, to underwrite uh, enhanced forward presence here in the Eastern flank, but also doing acting in the EU and in NATO in some novel ways. This is what Germany would be welcome to do to help an uh, Eastern flank uh, feel more secure with more credible defense and deterrence potential of NATO. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and we already have uh, a rather substantial list of, of pretty specific initiatives, uh, which uh, is only to be welcomed. Um, in the next round of questions slash comments, uh, it will be first Anja Dyner, then Bartosz Rybliński. So Anja, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Łukasz. Thank you, Marcin, for advertising our next uh, bulletin by PISM. Thank you all for a very interesting discussion. Um, as I'm an expert also, also on um, Russian um, defense policy and security issues, um, I would, would like to focus on, on Russia a little bit. Um, and it's a question for our German, uh, German colleagues, the authors of, of the report. You've mentioned plenty of times Russia as a threat, Russia as a challenge. Uh, you also said that um, uh, it, was, um, it was Russia who changed the fundamentals of um, European security. But at the same time, you said that uh, it would be extremely important to maintain channels of communication with Russia. And here comes my question. How do you see the future of um, our, I mean, EU slash NATO relations with Russia? What kind of uh, channels of communication should it be? Um, and uh, on what issues uh, you want to pay attention for, for first of all? Uh, what are the critical points for, uh, for our bilateral relations? Thank you very much. 
thank you very much. Uh, and now to Bartek Gudiński. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Bartosz Szydliński. I would like to uh, ask rather a historical question, namely uh, in two weeks, we are going to celebrate half of century of Willy Brandt's Kniefel. And we remember that Ostpolitik was both pragmatic uh, and rather moral uh, politics towards East. So I would like to ask both Polish and German panelists, do you see this anniversary as a potential good idea to um, rather resign from Nord Stream 2 uh, project by Germany to also show to the public opinion, both in Germany and abroad, that values in politics, in foreign politics matters. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we got uh, two questions uh, facing uh, East, um, but uh, I would like to maybe add one uh, on uh, my own, um, especially to, to, to the German uh, colleagues uh, about uh, the Polish-German relations. It's not that I'm counting, but you didn't really talk about Poland in the report. Poland is mentioned five times, uh, while France is mentioned 31 uh, times. Uh, yes, there is Minister Sikorski plea that Germany, uh, we expect Germany to do more, uh, which is a very nice uh, quote, uh, but it's the only quote, plus it's from 2011. Um, so I, cannot but feel a little bit uh, abandoned uh, when it comes to, to, to Poland uh, in uh, your report. And since we are among uh, friends, uh, we can discuss pretty openly. Uh, does it say anything about the place of Poland uh, in German thinking about foreign and security um, policy or to be more blunt? Uh, in your uh, site and when the, 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 the turning point, uh, is Poland seen as part of the problem, part of the challenge, uh, or it's seen as a potential partner, or it's actually not really there, or it's somewhere in the background, whereas there are some more uh, substantial uh, policy uh, issues um, to, uh, to resolve uh, in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll let you think a little bit uh, about it. Uh, um, I will also invite you to think about any questions that you would like to pose to the Polish participants um, of this uh, discussion. Uh, so if you allow me, I will start with uh, uh, Marcin uh, Tewlikowski, then I'll go to Justyna, uh, then to Boris, then to Tobias. Uh, so, Marcin, questions about uh, Russia, questions about um, Nord Stream 2, but, but also maybe how do you see, you see the, the, the place of Poland in, in the German debate? Well, uh, let me focus on, on Russia slash Nord Stream. Uh, basically, uh, I, my, now speaking from my experience and, and my own uh, contacts with German uh, counterparts, the pre-pandemic times, uh, of course, although this technology allows us to, to talk like today, so, so it's, uh, it's, we, can, we can sustain the links, but it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not the same, no doubt about it. Uh, I feel that we do share the understanding uh, of the threat which Russia poses to European security. Um, we do, under, do share the, the essence the, of the Russian policy, which is revision to change the, the, the political and legal order in Europe. But we differ on uh, prescriptions, on, on the, we differ on the question, on the answer to the question what to do with it. So basically, apparently Germany would like to see, or not like to see, but would like to, 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 
uh, induce a positive change in Russia by kind of reassuring it that we're not going to go for uh, Cold War 2.0. And this is the, my reading of the significance of the, of the Nord Stream 2 project. It is not that, that Germany in the first place needs this gas for economical reason. Uh, although I leave the, the floor here for those who, who can comment more uh, with more insight on the German energy mix and its, per its perspectives in 2020s and 2030s. But basically, I understand that this is a strong political signal to Russia that the West, NATO, EU is not going to ring fence Russia. Quite on the contrary, that Russia can be rewarded uh, with, with, with money and, and, uh, and, and political clout if it starts to behave at some point. The problem I can see, and I think it's the problem which is shared by many, if not majority of, of, of uh, Polish experts, uh, let's say the Polish strategic community, so both experts and practitioners, is that, is that we believe that Russia uh, only, um, let's say, um, considers changing its behavior when met with, uh, with forceful response. And of course, I'm not calling for escalation in the Eastern flank. Uh, we do need some kind of uh, a more substantial dialogue on Ru with Russia on how to limit the chance of the likelihood of, of uh, unintended escalation in the eastern flank. So I welcome the, the, the so I'm interested in what to, uh, what the Biden administration can do with regards to New START and maybe the, also the, the, the post INF environment here in Europe. But uh, I think that, that, uh, that uh, on Russia we differ in the sense that we still believe that the terrorist is should be robust and that we still need uh, uh, a lot of homework to be done still in the eastern flank to say that we have uh, we have uh, uh, increased the defense and the terrorists. So that would be my answer on, on, on where Poland and Germany is on Russia uh, and how Poland is seen by, by Germany. Well, uh, maybe we are too often seen as as as. Uh, as the Russophobic nation, but you know, okay, I very often say that, uh, you know, uh, I was once, I will finish with an anecdote, uh, uh, a true one. I was once talking to, to one of the relatives of my family uh, on, on, uh, on some kind of, uh, of uh, tax issues um, regarding a piece, of, a piece of land, a small one. And what I was presented in this discussion was uh, actually a uh, original first uh, paper uh, stating that that this piece of land belongs to that family, the ancestors of that family from the mid 19th century. And it was all in Russian with the Tsarist eagle there. So basically you cannot have a different attitude to Russia if you share uh, basically the historical awareness of, of, the, of the common history of this part of, of Europe, if in, in, in which unfortunately we have experienced a lot of uh, bad things from, from, from the Russian side. For that, you need, uh, you need to take uh, into account Polish, uh, as I said, legitimate threat perceptions and, and, and uh, 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 assumptions regarding where we stand as regards security environment in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. There might be a similar uh, document in my family archive, but from the state of Russia. So uh, there are different historical perspectives. Uh, over to you, Justyna. Uh, thank you. With regard to question on Nord Stream 2, I would uh, like to see um, um, uh, this happening, what you mentioned, uh, Mr. Rudlinski, this is a, re a resignation from the uh, Nord Stream 2 project by the German government, but I don't see uh, it happening for the reasons I mentioned in my presentations. Uh, I don't think Germans uh, are um, in a point uh, where they believe that uh, such a move is necessary. Uh, with regard, I, I find the, the question on the um, Pol place of Poland and the German uh, debate and security and defense very interesting uh, and uh, one that is worth uh, elaborating on. I think Poland is not very much present. Uh, I think we uh, we um, developed our discussions on security and defense in different bubbles. Uh, there is a different bubble in Germany and there is a different, a different security uh, and defense policy bubble in Poland. These bubbles meet through us mainly, through experts that participate uh, in uh, both in, po in the Polish and in the German debates, but uh, we are uh, mm, few. 
uh, we are few. We don't have this political impact that is very much needed in order uh, for uh, th these bubbles to uh, to um, come more, more closer and to talk to each other. The reasons for it, um, for this, um, uh, are multiple. One of them is difficult uh, political relations between Poland and Germany. The other is uh, the, that what uh, Martin mentioned, uh, the perspective on Poland from Germany as a country that has uh, only one focused, uh, a very narrow one. Um, but I see also progress. Uh, I see um, experts, institutions in Germany that see the need to invite Polish experts into the, uh, the German debate. Um, and uh, I uh, experience uh, this myself in the uh, this year and in the coming year. Uh, and I I'm happy when I get su such invitations uh, since they um, uh, make it possible for me to explain the Polish perspective, to, to explain the Polish uh, uh, point of view. But at the same time, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because we live uh, really in very different mindsets. And I am, um, uh, I encounter this every time when I talk to an audience that is not uh, really versed in the security and defense uh, uh, policy issues. This is very difficult to convey our message to the German society, to the people that are not dealing with these issues professionally. Uh, and uh, I think we should think about a proper narrative, as Tobias Bunde mentioned that, uh, how to convey uh, our argument, our message, uh, to the German, uh, not only political lead, but, uh, but also um, society as a whole. Many thanks. Uh, and, and I think it would be uh, great for, for Boris and, and for Tobias to, to also respond to, the, to, to what uh, Martin and, and Justyna uh, said. So Boris, first over to you. Happy. Lots of, lots of very good questions and I'll, I'll try and be very concise. Um, so, um, Ukash, on, on the question you raised, um, I apologize for not mentioning Poland more often in the report. My apology on behalf of MSC. Um, and, and perhaps it is a reflection of the fact that perhaps Poland is not as present in the German debate as it should be. I would, however, point out that uh, we invited a very eminent poll um, for the kickoff of the uh, of the report, a gentleman by name of Sławomir Debski, who is uh, part of this call. So one of the four think tankers on stage when we rep presented this report was uh, Sławek, along with um, Natalie Tocci from Italy, Robin Niblet from the UK, and um, Kandri Leek from Estonia. So um, Poland was there uh, when, we, when we started this. Um, I think we should do a lot more to bring Poland into the picture in the German debate. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely open to, to help in any way I can do that. Um, on Russia, um, since Anna asked this question, I would just quote from the report. Um, All attempts in recent years to enter into a constructive dialogue with Moscow have failed. I think that's a pretty strong statement. And then it goes on, channels for dialogue must be kept open, but in the short term, what is necessary is strengthening deterrence and defense and building resilience. I think that's a statement uh, to which I imagine many Poles could agree. Um, so it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a sober look at, at Russia. But to Anna's question, of course, we must keep channels of communication open. Um, during the Cold War, we kept channels of communication open to the Soviet Union because Russia is a major power. It is our neighbor. It is also Poland's neighbor. So we must be in touch. What could we talk about? We could talk about arms control, for example. New START would be an obvious issue to talk about. And I think we should talk about the pandemic um, uh, on another issue. Um, very briefly on Nord Stream 2. Um, there is a debate in Germany about Nord Stream 2. There are politicians from several parties, including the Conservatives and the Greens, um, who argue um, that it should be shut down. Um, my personal view, which I've also expressed on Twitter, is if we shut it down, let's do it for a reason. Let's have, you know, let's try and achieve an impact, an effect. So one thing that I, that I have said is that um, if we look at the situation in Belarus, 
let's use Nord Stream 2 as, um, as, uh, as a lever. Let's try and use it um, to convey to Moscow that if they suppress um, democracy um, in, in Belarus, then, um, then that is perhaps the price they must pay. Um, final point, perhaps from my side, history is important. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I started out as a historian of East European history. And I think the way history is understood is extremely important also for the, the dialogue between Poles and Germans. Um, as you know, the, the Bundestag has recently decided to create a memorial in Berlin. That's important. But I think what is equally important is for a Polish perspective on security and defense and the maintenance of democracy um, to be part of the German debate. Um, because the lesson of German history, and I'm a great fan of Willy Brandt, by the way, um, the lesson of German history is not that we should downplay the importance of military force. Um, the lesson of, of German history, I think, is that we must maintain democracy and the rule of law, resist authoritarianism, and be able to stand up to outside powers who are trying to eliminate democracy and all these good things. That's the way I look at it. And I think that's a Polish angle on this discussion as well. And it should be represented. So what we call Wehrhafte Demokratie in German, um, a democracy that can defend itself, that's, that's my lesson from history. Thank you very much. And Tobias, now over to you. Thank you. Um, on, on Russia and Nord Stream 2, I think I can only echo um, Boris' comments. Um, as, as he mentioned, um, Nord Stream 2 is also contested in, in Germany as well. Uh, and of course, I mean, our debate in Germany has in many ways reached a dead end, so to say. And, and the Germans, if, if that was some, something that would need to be discussed, there would need to be a European framework, a transatlantic framework to find an off-ramp, so to say. I don't see any, any chance that uh, the Germans would, would somehow uh, end this project um, without, without being part of a broader uh, agreement among uh, the allies. Um, and I, I don't think it's, it's likely um, right now. Um, second, uh, on Poland, um, it's, it's right that uh, Poland isn't mentioned, mentioned as, as often as, as, as France is. Um, in a way, that's, that's, that certainly reflects uh, the German debate, and I, I can only underline that I, I would welcome um, um, a stronger uh, Polish role in, in the German debate. As I mentioned before, this friendly tugging is, is of course, very important. Um, I would also, I mean, as a as an independent uh, and non-official uh, person here, I can I can also just give you my my impression from the German debate. I think for many Germans, Poland, um, let's face it, is is um, is still a difficult uh, partner because um, on the one hand we've seen tremendous progress in in German Polish relations, and I believe uh, from my point of view, in many ways this has been one of the most um, wonderful uh, success stories uh, of, of German uh, foreign relations after the end of the Cold War. So uh, everything that, that, that could be done between our two countries. Um, but on the other hand, there are also still some, some ongoing issues. Um, people here have followed uh, the debate, the election campaign recently in Poland uh, with uh, accusations that the Germans interfere in the elections uh, with German media, etc. We have the, the rule of law debate, um, the democracy debate. That is something that, that must not be underestimated. Um, you've all recognized, I believe, that German politicians, especially German politicians in Berlin, have been really careful, have kept a very low profile in this debate because it's sensitive and because they didn't want to, to interfere too much. Um, but this is, of course, something that is very present in, in the German debates. Uh, in the German debate among experts and in the security uh, community. Um, that is something that, that, that many are uh, concerned about. And this is something that I believe also affects uh, the presence of, of Poland in, in the debate here. I hope that we will have a more constructive um, approach in, in the future here, but there are also some, um, yeah, as you, as you know, some, some fundamental issues here at stake. And uh, as Boris uh, mentioned in a very di diplomatic way, um, that this is something that's, that we need to deal with. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I very much appreciate everyone's uh, response uh, to, to this question. And I think this is something that uh, we, we, need to, we need to discuss uh, and not kind of swept under the, uh, the carpet. Um, we are almost at the end, uh, but uh, if uh, we have one or two minutes uh, to go beyond uh, our allocated time, um, then before I pass the floor to Director Dembski, um, I would uh, just like to invite uh, each one of you to, to maybe one minute uh, the, the final words uh, or response to the question that was put on us on, on YouTube, uh, which was basically, what about the United Kingdom? Uh, where does the relationship uh, in the uh, UK, uh, uh, Germany, France, and Poland, how does the UK fit in? So if you can uh, just squeeze it into a one minute response each, then I'll start with Boris, then I'll go to Marcin, Justyna, and Tobias. Excellent. Many thanks, Wukash. So I, I tweeted yesterday on the UK commenting on the news about um, increased defense spending. Um, and, and I think that is very good news. The UK has decided to invest into defense and specifically into future capabilities such as space and cyber and artificial intelligence. And I think it's positioned itself to be a very important security actor in terms of transatlantic security and European security. And um, despite the difficult issues outstanding between the European Union and the UK, we should do our best to keep the UK on board, um, not just in NATO, but also beyond NATO for these security issues. And my, my last comment, if I may, Wukash, is since several Polish colleagues asked about um, capabilities and the eastern flank and what can be done. I think that that's very relevant. It's very important. And, and to those Germans who are concerned about uh, nuclear weapons and, and nuclear deterrence and, and the risks involved, I would say the best thing we can do is to invest in strong conventional defense on the eastern flank because that reduces um, the risks in a big way. So Germany ought to do that. And, and, and there's some good ideas out there, I think, in terms of military infrastructure, military mobility, and these future capabilities that have something to do with resilience that are so important as well. So I think that's something that, um, that we should uh, certainly look into. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, over to you. Well, to finish, I can only double down on what I said um, uh, before on, on what Germany can do for, for uh, the, the stable and peaceful future of, of this part of the world. But there was the UK part, so I cannot resist not commenting on the idea of, of uh, creating new inst institutions to link United Kingdom after Brexit uh, with European defense policies, the ideas of having uh, bodies like the European Security Council, which is very vague idea and vague concept. Uh, I can uh, not stress uh, enough that uh, that creating another layer of, of uh, institutions and governance in, in Europe in these turbulent times would not do uh, uh, good to, to, to the common purpose of, of stabilizing the continent and reinforcing our defense and deterrence. And so this would be the final comment uh, I would have, except the, 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 the reiteration of the fact that Germany has a lot, of, a lot to offer and a lot to, uh, to, to, to do on the eastern flank for Poland and for the bilateral relation uh, in defense matters too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justyna? Um, I think that um, from my perspective, we should um, stop uh, talking too much about uh, improving transatlantic relations, about European strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, Europe doing more with regard to defense, uh, but uh, come to uh, some uh, concrete proposals. How can we do that in different formats? And these formats may vary. It might be German, Polish, US, uh, uh, cooperation that might be an additional European or Weimar engagement on the Eastern flank. But I would wish for um, some concrete uh, articles with proposals, reports uh, on, uh, that deal with these issues that would somehow uh, reinvigorate 
the debate both in Poland and in uh, Germany uh, on the need to do uh, to uh, cooperate more in mu multilateral formats. And I think our attention should should go right now in this direction. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Tobias. Well, I, I only have one point, which is uh, to thank all of you for taking the time for having us for this debate. And I really look forward to, to engaging with uh, all of you on, on these debates and on the concrete formats and proposals that uh, Justina just mentioned. I think it's very important to have that debate between um, Polish and, and German experts, politicians, etc. So uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity here. I look forward to, um, to seeing you um, hopefully in person uh, soon in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just say it was a, a pleasure to moderate this uh, far reaching uh, and very rich discussion. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, everyone who participated in the Zoom, but of course, especially uh, our panelists, uh, Justyna, uh, Boris, uh, Tobias and uh, Marcin. Uh, and now for the uh, closing, uh, over over to you, Director Demski. Well, um, again, I would like to uh, exercise my uh, gratefulness to uh, Tobias, uh, uh, Boris, uh, Unique Security uh, Conference people. Um, first, for an excellent report. Uh, second, for excellent debate. Um, I believe this meeting only proved that, that we need more such conversations. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, also in different formats, not necessarily um, uh, all should uh, uh, go um, you know, to the public domain immediately. Um, so perhaps in the future we, we, we can uh, talk on more detailed and practical uh, uh, issues uh, behind the closed doors. Um, this communication between uh, Polish and German uh, foreign and security uh, community uh, is of crucial importance for both countries. Uh, so I'm happy that Polish Institute of International Affairs and Munich security, security Conference can provide institutional umbrella for this kind of conversation. Um, and uh, I can promise that we will continue uh, to provide such a, such a ground for, um, for fair um, uh, and open conversation. Uh, um, uh, perhaps we should consider a kind of the um, joint paper uh, report uh, on this um, interdep interdependence uh, in the field of, of uh, defense and security between Poland and Germany. Um, because I'm, uh, I, I fully believe that uh, uh, both German and Polish public should know more about that. Um, something which is obvious for, uh, for experts, analysts, uh, some politicians uh, maybe, but not necessarily for the general public. Um, so we are ready to do that. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward for further cooperation. Thank you very much, Boris, Tobias. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much, Slavek, to you and, and all of your colleagues in, in Warsaw. It was a great pleasure. Yeah? All the best. Yeah, Louisiana. Those <laughs>